Hi guys, Mark Dawes, NFPS Limited again. And this is a short video about what do you do if you're a trainer and someone turns up for training who's actually not physically capable or physically fit enough to do the training. Uh, and the reason I'm raising this is because in the last week alone, we've had two door supervisor trainers contact us because in both cases, they've been sent people to do the training who in one case the, the person didn't have an arm and in the other case the person didn't have an, a hand. They actually had no fingers, no hand and in one case no arm. Now obviously as a result of that they cannot do the physical intervention module or at least they're struggling to do it because they can't hold someone safely. Now the problem for the trainers in the door supervision world is up until now these people have been working on doors because they've got a license. So they've come up for their renewal. Now the renewal requires them to do the physical intervention module and that means grabbing hold of people and being able to physically control them. Now obviously if they've only got one arm or one hand that limits their ability to do that. But the concern for the trainers is if they don't pass them then these, these people cannot no long, you know, they cannot work on a door, they can no longer actually go to work. So their, their job is compromised and the trainers were very concerned about you know, basically failing someone who's then out of a job. Now what the law says on this is that you have to make reasonable adjustments and that means that if you are going to employ someone who's got a disability as such then they're protected by law and in the UK it's the Equality Act 2010 and in Northern Ireland it's the Disability Discrimination Act 1995. And what these acts require is that you make uh, reasonable adjustments. So tr you know, disabled people who are disadvantaged have to be given access to equal opportunities where possible. Uh, recreation and refreshment facilities and an employer has to make reasonable adjustments even if they don't employ the person directly so even if that person is working on a subcontracted voluntary or charity basis so all employers must consider that person's disability and do as much as they can reasonably to make adjustments in the workplace to enable that person to, with a disability to be able to do the job now examples could involve things as you're seeing on the screen in front of you now doing things in another way. For example, allowing someone with a social anxiety disorder to have their own desk instead of hot desking. Now, we incorporate this sometimes when we have people turn up for, for training who have a fear of exams. So they have, they have a, a phobia of sitting a written exam. They're absolutely great at doing this stuff, but they have a fear of doing an exam. And we actually make adjustments to enable them to take those exams without you know, a disadvantage to them, if you like. You know, making physical changes to the workplace. So if you've got someone uh, in, a, in a wheelchair, for example, then you would install a ramp and that, that's you know thing you see every day in, in everyday workplaces. So letting a disabled person work somewhere else, for example, on the ground floor, it, particularly if they're a wheelchair user, because you've got to take into consideration fire contingencies and, and emergency procedures. Um, changing their equipment, so providing a special keyboard for someone if they've got arthritis. And, and these examples I'm giving you here are directly off the, the government's website for the Equality Act, in other words, the type or examples of reasonable adjustments you can, you can make, and allowing employees who become disabled to, to be, have a phased return to work and, and being able to work flexible hours, for example, and part-time. So, as I've said, these are examples of what reasonable adjustments would be in terms of, you know, of what is shown on, on the government website. Now, when it comes to physical intervention, you know, that's there for a reason. That's there because someone has to physically control someone because there's a health and safety requirement or it's part of the emergency procedures to control people who are exhibiting challenging behaviour. Now, obviously the questions we've got have come from door supervisors, but this is a requirement for all of you out there who are training people who, who may have someone turn up for training, for example, who says, well, I can't kneel down or I've got a back injury or a neck injury or they may have other physical impairments that, that, that stops them or prevents them from doing the training. But well, what this regulation says, now this is regulation 13, and I covered this on the last video in relation to refresher training, so we're going to come back to it again. And it says that every employer shall, in entrusting tasks to his employees, take into account their capabilities as regards health and safety. So in other words, what this regulation is saying is that if we give someone a job to do, we have to make sure that they can do it. When we entrust them to do that job, we have to make sure that they actually have the capability, the physical and the mental capability to be able to do the job that we're giving them to do. In the approved code of practice that underpins that regulation, it says this. It says, when allocating work to employ employees, employers should ensure that the demands of the job do not exceed the employee's ability to carry out the work without risk to themselves or others. Employers should take account of the employee's capabilities and the level of training 
knowledge and experience. So this is the approved code of practice that underpins the regulation. So to comply with the regulation, you need to comply with this. Now in the guidance that goes with this, it says this. It says the risk assessment and subsequent reviews of the risk assessment will help determine the level of training and competence needed for each type of work. Now, competence is a key word in health and safety. And what they say in the guidance is that competence is the ability to do the work required to the necessary standard. So if we just come back um, to what the Equality uh, Act and the Disability Discrimination Act require, is that if we can put a reasonable adjustment in place, like a, a ramp or a workstation or a different keyboard, to enable a person to do their work to the required competence standard, that's absolutely reasonable and it should be done. However, if it comes down to physical intervention training, and in the cases that I've been asked to, to comment on, the person hasn't got an arm or they haven't got a hand, so they cannot physically hold someone, then there's very few reasonable adjustments that you can make in terms of, of how you would compensate for that without actually compromising the ability for them to control someone physically, which is fundamentally the key skill or the key competency, if you like, that we're asking that person to do. Oh, bear with me. So in summary, what we're saying here is, is if you can make reasonable adjustments, then you are required by law to do so, provided that the person can still do what is required of them to a competent standard without compromising their safety or the health, safety and welfare of others who may be affected by what they're being expected to do or, or what they simply cannot do. And in short, every employer is responsible for ensuring that the demands, and I'm quoting now, that the demands of the job do not exceed the employer's ability to carry out the work without risk to themselves or others. And that's straight from the Management of Health and Safety Work Regulations, Regulation 13, 1999. This underpins the Act. Now, I've actually written to the Security Industry Authority on this one. I've emailed them, and they very kindly uh, replied to that. And they're absolutely clear on that, and they've said exactly the same thing that I'm saying to you here. If you can make a reasonable adjustment for someone, so let, let's say that someone has, has got a hearing problem, or you know, they've got a, a minor injury, which can be compensated for by doing the skill another way. And this is another issue. You know, it's, it's back to you know, making the shoe fit the foot, not the foot fit the shoe. If we can change the skill, and make a reasonable adjustment to the technique, if you like, so that the person can do it to the required standard, that we must do. So having a fixed rigid system where something can't be changed could actually be infringing on an individual's rights under equality and dis disability discrimination to start with. So if we can make reasonable adjustments, that's fine. But if the person hasn't got a limb, particularly an arm or a hand, where they cannot grab hold of someone, then, you know, the, well, the question is, is what reasonable adjustments are you going to make? Because the other side of the coin is this. If you sign that person off uh, as being able to do it, and they can't do it, and there's evidence that they can't do it, and as a result of that, someone gets seriously injured or, God forbid, killed, then questions could be asked by you as a trainer as to how was that person assessed as being competent when it's pretty obvious they haven't got a hand or an arm. Now, these are difficult decisions to make. Uh, it obviously compromises someone's livelihood, uh, but you have to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. So where you can make reasonable adjustments and it's okay to do so without compromising anything, great, do it. However, the Management of Health and Safety at Work Regulations 1999, Regulation 13, is absolutely clear. And it says that when you employ someone or you entrust a task to that person, they have to have the capability to do it to a competent standard. And competent is what would be reasonably expected of a person who is expected to undertake and carry out that task to the recognised required standard. So in physical intervention or restraint, that means can they physically stop them, can they restrain them. So I hope that's of help. Uh, if you have any questions, please email me and I'll, I'll speak to you again on the next video. But thanks again for listening and for those of you that sent the questions in, thanks ever so much for sending the questions in and to the SIA, thanks for your reply as well.